God has a great plan for us. He's designed us. He's made us. He's created us. He's given us life that we could be people that also share that life with others, that we can use the blessings and the gifts and talents, that we could do his work in this world. Uh, we know that there's a lot of evil forces in the world, and uh, part of that has to do with the way we look at the world, the way we look at life, the value we place even on human life. And that's one of the things I want to talk about today. Last week we talked about uh, morality and kind of how morality is changing and shifting and really where morality comes from. And this is kind of an extension of that today. And what I want to talk about is human life and where the value of that is. Because in our society, a lot of people are not exactly sure who we are, who are human beings. Because the fact is, if we are just uh, a part of an evolutionary process, if we have just kind of arrived by accident, and it's just a bunch of chemicals that we have, and really, in essence, in essence, we are not much different than the ape. Because, you know, if you kind of look at the, you know, the, the evolutionary chart, uh, you know, we're not, we're really not that much different than the dog. Maybe a lot different than the cat. Uh, we're not different from the fish and the birds. We're not different from, you know, the worms and the, the ants, even the mosquitoes. So we are just a part of life in this world. Uh, we just carry in ourselves these complex pieces of information of atoms and chromosomes and everything else that goes into life. But really, we are, we're just animals. And if that's the case, then our life does not have much more value than that of your dog, and I know you love your dog, or your fish, or any other living thing like the ant, or the beetle, or the fly, mosquito, you know, maybe things that we don't appreciate so much in life. They have just as much right to live as you or I. Well, that's the way a lot of people would look at life, and so life is not valuable. And therefore, perhaps one reason why, there's very complex, I understand, but we have more people willing to take life. We seem to have more people today, specifically young white men, right, that like carrying around high-powered rifles and killing people in schools and in uh, other places, the malls and the stores and... Some of them use bombs. Some of them mail packages in order to take life. They don't value human life. We have another epidemic in our society of people taking their own life. They say, well, I have the right over my life. I can take my own life. So we've got this challenge of, well, who are we and what is the value of life? So I can stand before you today with statistics, with pictures, and I can tell you emotional stories, maybe that I've heard, or maybe that have been made up. But you want to know that's not helpful. And I'll tell you why, because the other side can also have their pictures and their stats and their emotional stories of why they do the things that they do. And they may find a sympathetic audience and say, well, I understand. That's reasonable. That's logical. That's kind of where we end up. The only thing I can appeal to you and to myself, maybe the only thing you can use to appeal to others, is what is the value of human life. Now, part of our challenge is not everyone believes what we believe about human life. Human life was begun by God. It is ordained by God. It is found in God's word. So again, some people don't believe in God. They don't believe in God's word. And at that point, maybe we do have to appeal to some statistics and emotional stories and pictures. But that's not us. And so we wonder, what does God say? So from the very beginning, when God created the world, he created 
people, men and women, specifically a man, a woman named Adam and Eve. But it says, let us make man in our image. He didn't say that about anything else. He didn't like, well, let's make the cows and let's make the horses and the dogs and the cats. They are not made in God's image. They were made by God. But here's something very special. We are made in God's image, in God's likeness. And God has given us dominion, able to rule over the other life in the world. And God emphasizes this a few times here in Genesis chapter 1. It goes on to say, and this is how God did make it. He first of all said, we're going to do it. And he says, this is what we've done. We've made man in the image of God. So we are image bearers or something about us that expresses who God is. There's almost like a piece of God. It's the spirit of God that lives in us. And so we are different than all other animal life. We are not our own. We've been created by God. We actually belong to him. So the very creation shows us that life is of great value, and human life is the superior of all life in this world because we've been made in God's image. Genesis chapter 4, I mean, this is so shortly after the creation. It was, you know, within the, 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 you know, the life of Adam and Eve. They had children, many children, but... Two of their sons are mentioned, Cain and Abel. And you remember what happened with Cain? He offered up to God a sacrifice that was not acceptable. We don't have all the details. We don't want to get into that right yet. But but Cain was angry. He was mad. He was upset. But look what God said to him. After Cain was so angry that he went out and he killed his brother, Out of this anger or resentment, I don't know if he hated his brother, he hated God, or he hated both. But God said, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now, this doesn't happen, you know, when another species on earth dies. God doesn't say, well, the blood is crying out. Some great injustice, some great tragedy, some great crime has been committed. Your blood, your, the blood of your brother cries out from the ground. And now you are under a curse. You're driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood. The, the earth is receiving the blood. The earth is going, uh, is taking this act that Cain did to his brother. Why is that? Because life is valuable in God's sight because we are made in God's image. We find this throughout the Old Testament. So, for instance, we go on a little bit later in Genesis chapter 9. This is right after the days when Noah built the ark. He came off the ark, offered a sacrifice to God. This is what God said to Noah. Whoever sheds sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Okay, so again, value of life. I don't think anybody said to you, Now, maybe they thought it because they don't like you too much, but, you know, if you kill that fly that's bothering you today, flying around in your house, you kill that fly, then you deserve to die. Oh, no, that's not what God said. He'll go on to say that that you can eat of any animal that's on the earth. In the Old Testament, they could eat of any of the, the clean animals, but that was not life for a life. So human life is so valuable, God says, that For someone that murders intentionally, that their life would be, that's how valuable, God's just trying to say, this is how valuable life is. You just don't go and take another's life. Why? Why? Because God said, well, that would just make a lot of people sad. Or you'd be taking away someone's father or their mother. Or you'd be taking away their heritage or their destiny or their future or uh, their happiness. That's not why. Now, that may be a worldly argument. Look at all the people you've hurt by killing somebody. That's not why. That's not the reason God said. What did he say? Well, you can read it. In the image of God, God made man. We are in his image. So we are not to take another life. So it's based on what God says because we are made in his image. 
that all life is valuable. And of course, beside that, I've got the Ten Commandments, which were not even kind of written and came into existence for another four or five hundred years after this event. They didn't have the command. Well, how in the world did Cain know that killing his brother was wrong? Why would God have to tell somebody like Noah about a life for a life that murder is wrong? Even before a written law. Because it's always been wrong. Well, I don't remember Cain ever getting that news that murder was evil and wrong and you'd be punished severely for it. But he knew it. God held him accountable for what he had done. He didn't just say, oh, you know, Cain, you, you didn't do the right thing. Try a little harder next time to control your temper, but carry on. Oh, it wasn't like that. I think there's something inside of us, if we're honest, that we'd look and say, there's something about human life that is valuable, precious, and something that needs to be honored. Genesis chapter 37, you remember Joseph, his brothers? Remember now, Joseph was the youngest. Everybody loves the youngest. I'm the youngest, by the way, in my family. Everybody loves the youngest, because the youngest are just so wonderful. They're so easy to get along with. Right? Their parents are always just as hard on the youngest as they are on the older ones. Not true. You know, but everybody, no, not everybody loves the youngest. They hated him. I mean, how can you hate, has, well, maybe I shouldn't ask the question. How many people here have hated their younger brother or your younger sister so much you wanted to kill them? Now, in your mind, you may have thought that at one point, but you, you were never really serious about doing it. Killing your own, like they literally said, here he is, let's kill him. And they had the whole plan figured. This is premeditated. This wasn't in out of a fit of rage or anger. I mean, maybe they've had anger and rage for a long time over this young whippersnapper that's loved so much by dad. Let's take him. We'll kill him. But what else do we need to do? We need to cover it up. So they came up with a whole plan. This is what we're going to tell dad. We're going to tell him, you know, they wouldn't go back and tell dad, oh, yeah, we didn't like him so much, so we murdered him. No, they knew it was wrong. But see, even in the old, like we think that, oh, killing somebody or this idea of vengeance or anger or, it's new, it's not new. It's been around since the very beginning. It really comes from Satan and we can actually look at a whole lesson that talks about how Satan has used murder and killing to get rid of man and specifically to get rid of a lineage that is going to lead to a savior. See, God said that in the Old Testament, and guess what? Satan knew it. And you look at all the lives that were either taken by murder or people that tried to murder babies in the Old Testament, it was in the lineage of Christ. They wanted to kill their younger brother, but we know that's wrong. Today, we seems like we value families. Yeah, we love families. We enjoy families. But families, you know, are a part of our society, but sometimes in our family, maybe not in our personal, physical family, but in our, our world of family, of human beings, sometimes we look at people and say, well, is everybody just as valuable as others? Or do we kind of have a ranking system? Do we have some people that we say we don't really care about them? We don't really care about their future. We don't care about their happiness. And sometimes we may even say we don't even care about their life. So sometimes in the world, it can be a tough place. Sometimes it can be a dangerous place. Sometimes for seniors. Sometimes people take advantage of seniors. Sometimes seniors are too kind, if I could say it's possible to be too kind. Or in other words, too naive. They're easily taken advantage of because they're so trusting. And they're so kind and loving. But there's also people that take advantage of seniors sometimes in their own families because they don't care for them, they don't provide for them. Uh, and I'm not even just talking about financially, I'm talking about morally. I'm talking about relationally, I'm talking about emotionally, I'm talking about psychologically taking care of even your own parents or your grandparents. Caring for them. 
And perhaps there's a time in our society, even with something called physician-assisted suicide, where, hey, you know, you're kind of getting older and you're kind of getting sicker and uh, you're not able to produce as much. And I, I mean, I'm not even sure how valuable you are anymore to society. And, you know, you know, we're kind of a growing population. and We got to, you know, thin out the masses a little bit. So I don't know if that's where we're going. I, you know, I'm not a prophet. I'm not trying to look into the future. But, but if we don't value life, then somebody who is too literally taxing upon society because of their senior years, then maybe we can encourage them to check out early. I don't know if we're headed that way in our society or not. But if we're not sure about the value of human life, if it is not from God, and if you're not a whole lot different than any of the other animal or reptile, or even the insect world, then maybe that, that's somewhere we'd be headed. What about people that have disabilities? This is already very real, that sometimes people kill because of disabilities. We're going to get to that in a minute. But people that are disabled. We have, well, we'd have to assess the situation. How much health care should they be allowed? How much money should we spend on them? How should we care for them? Do they have as equal right to live, depending on how severe the disability is? Do you have a right, as much right to live as somebody else? Now, if you're created in God's sight, and, and, and in, in God's value kingdom, and in God's image, yes, you have just as much right as anyone else. What about those people that are poor? Those people that cannot provide for themselves? How do we view them? How do we look upon them? Second class citizen? Somebody we don't really care about? Don't help? Don't serve? Would we welcome them just as equally as we would welcome an extremely rich person? And, and I know we can, that would never, ever happen. Well, apparently you're a whole lot better than the church in the first century because that happened a lot in the first century. Like James says, like he's not making a hypothetical situation. Well, if a rich person comes in and a poor person comes in, what do we do? Everybody flocks to the rich person, wants to be buddy-buddy, and hey, hey, they probably want to get some selfies and all that stuff. But you know, the poor person is like, well, you know, we hardly even welcome them. We hardly even say Hi. But is that the way we are? Most of us, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, we're not supposed to be honest, church. Of course we're not. We would never do that. Right, what did Paul say to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 11? Yeah, the rich people can come to church early at their potlucks and they eat it all and they drink it all and they're literally bloated and drunk. Why? Because the poor people have to come later because they're still working in the fields. By the time they get, there's nothing to eat at all. And Paul says, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, I thought you guys were the church. You were Christians. You loved Jesus. Apparently not. We've got a big problem here, the way you're acting and living and treating other people, especially the people that are poor. What about people that are foreign? What about the immigrant? Right? So I think that's a worthy discussion. How do we help the people? Even how do we help people that would like to come to the U.S.? Just a real quick footnote, we cannot help everyone that wants to live in the United States of America, because I'm sure you look at our world population, that would be at least 4 billion people that would like to leave their homeland to come to live in the United States of America. And most of them would not be from Mexico. They would be some, from some very, very extremely poor countries. Or some countries that had a, a very closed and difficult political system. They come, what? America's... The, Home of the brave, land of the free. Yeah, people want to come here to live. So how could we make that happen? How can we help people that are coming here, right? I think that's a worthy question for the church. And by the way, if we really want to talk about this, I'm not talking about who you vote for in the next political election, because this is not a political talk. We're talking about the Bible. Let's talk about how the people that are living in our communities, in our area, maybe they're in Detroit, maybe they need help. How are we going to help them? They're already here. That's what the Bible talks about. They're here. How do we help them? Well, 
You can give some money, maybe. You can take them for a dinner, maybe. Well, maybe more specifically in the Bible, you invite them to stay at your house because you have an extra bedroom. Or you got a place on the floor. You help people. You serve people. That's, that's the biblical model. It's not who we're voting for in the next election. But perhaps the biggest one, and it really is the biggest problem of human life, is a place where uh, babies in the womb are those that are most vulnerable and those that are most attacked and those that suffer the most. And so people have said the most dangerous place to live in the world today is in a mother's womb. Because we don't value the baby. Why? Well, we're not sure if it's a baby. It's kind of interesting. You ever heard people talk about that? It's not a baby. It's a fetus. Have, have, have you ever saw a woman when she's pregnant and she's all excited and she's going to have, it's her first baby. They've been trying for a long time. They're going to have a baby. And then you went up to them and said, um, hey, you ever thought any names for the fetus? You ever talk like, why wouldn't you say that? By the way, fetus, you know what, what is fetus? Fetus is the Greek, uh, Latin is the Latin name for baby. It just means baby. But what have we made fetus? Uh, it's just a, 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 a bunch of cells. It's just, just a, a little bit of tissue. It could be not much different than cancer kind of not really a part of your body, growing inside your body, and if you don't want it, then, well, you can terminate it. You can get it removed like you would cancer. But is it a baby? Is it made in God's image? Is it life? Is it valuable? Who gets to decide? What about this idea of baby? So, uh, again, I don't want to make it big as far as you know, having a lot of lists, but just to show that it's a big problem. Like, you know, people think, well, there's a few, there's sometimes some of those abortions do go on, and it's not that big of a deal, and, you know, they're very sparse, you know, it doesn't happen a whole lot. We don't need to be concerned with it. There's other things we can talk about, um, but this is one of the things I do want to talk about today, and it kind of ties in with just the value of life itself, and how we determine what is valuable. So I'm guessing by now you can read, and so you've read the stats. I'm not even going to read them, but uh, you can look at the impact that abortion and those people that support it, those people that practice it. One thing I do want to say is, don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure there's going to be some people here in the audience today that have had an abortion. There's some men here that have encouraged a woman to have an abortion. And there are some people that may have even worked in abortion clinics or worked with doctors that provide abortions. So one thing I want to say, I'm not here to judge you. One thing I do want to say is there is a lot of forgiveness and grace for you, uh, just like there is for me. But I know I've talked to people in the church that have had abortions, um, some of them when they were very young. And maybe some of them even tried to justify it their own mind. I know a young woman in this church that worked for a doctor that provided abortions. And so what do we do with that? What do we do with that information? How, how do we deal with that? So we want to be very compassionate. We want to say there's a lot of grace. There's a lot of forgiveness, right? I mean, that's why Jesus came. So I don't want anyone to go away feeling, you know, overwhelmed and overburdened, and especially if you've been carrying it around for a long time. We just want to say there is grace in Christ Jesus for all of us, no matter what we've done. All right. Um, just one other thing then, as far as legally goes, um, uh, the Unborn Victims of Violence Act, so that just basically means that if a woman is pregnant, has a baby, and she wants the baby, and something happens to her, a crime is enacted upon her, and I believe this was uh, with the Lacey uh, crime that was committed in California where the husband killed the wife, she was pregnant, he was uh, um, charged with a double murder for, the, for his wife 
and for an unborn baby. So what they're saying is the unborn baby is a life. It's not just a, a clump of cells. It's a life. And you can actually be charged with murder if the baby dies. So it's kind of interesting. If you want the baby, it's a life, and you can be charged with murder. If you don't want the baby, it's not a life. You can decide to terminate life, and within 24 hours, you're on your way. Seems kind of odd, doesn't it? Is there, does anybody see you? There's a little... So it just depends. If you want the baby, it is. If you don't want the baby, it's not. So it's basically just based upon a woman, how she feels about the baby. Or could we even say how she feels that day about the baby? Because unfortunately, there are probably some women that had abortions because they were really struggling through maybe a week or two or a month while they were pregnant. Does anybody know that sometimes, sometimes women can be emotional when they're pregnant? No, I know you probably never met anybody like that, but it's true. You can have an abortion, you, you regret it later. So, to a certain degree, even our society says that babies are alive. Well, what does God say? And this was from the scripture that Josh read a little while ago. Here God says this, and this is about, this is actually David speaking to God and, and just kind of in his prayer, speaking to God, for you God created my inmost being, so he's saying you've created me the way I am, you knit me together in my mother's womb, so it sounds like God was working, like, it's like us, you know, we can look at ourselves and say, well, I can kind of figure out who I am now. You know, my strengths and my weaknesses, my disposition, my personality, my characteristics, my likes and my dislikes, and the way I think and the way I act. And, you know, I, I understand not only am I physically different than you, but I am emotionally and relationally. I mean, we're just all different. We're, we're unique. And this saying, even in the womb, God is working these things out. You didn't just come out as a baby and God said, oh, well, this is what I have to work with. Okay, well, let's see what we can do with it. God made us this way when we're still in the mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, what's he talking about? When I was in the womb, this is when I was fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. Well, he goes on to say this in the next verse. My frame was not hidden from you. So in other words, what I was and how I was developing, evidently it was hidden from somebody else. Because back then, they didn't have ultrasounds. Right? They didn't have a, a way that they could look inside the belly to see what the baby even looked like, how big the baby was at that time. It was hidden. No, but I was not hidden from you. My mom couldn't see me, my dad, my friends, all the rest. No, nobody could see me, but God, you saw me. You were paying attention. You were looking over. You were watching out for me. You saw me grow when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, when things were happening. So God literally is making us, even when we're in the, mo uh, the womb, to be who we are even today. In Psalm 139, verse 16, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God even had a plan for his life. That's why God has made us. He, he had a plan for us. Even when we were conceived, he had a plan for us. So we could even say before we were conceived, he knew we were going to show up. He knew what was going to happen. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows, he knows the end of the book, the end of the story. He knows what's going to happen. And so God had it all worked out. So this is saying that God takes even a child a baby in the womb, very seriously. Isaiah 49 says it this way. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me from my birth. He has made mention of my name. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. Because what do we say today? Well, a baby's born. The parents may say, Especially back then, we didn't know if it was going to be a boy or a girl. So what are you going to name it? Well, I haven't really thought of it. Like, I don't know. Well, we have to wait to find out, boy or girl. And then we're going to discuss what the name is. And so the parents say, let's name. And I don't believe God, you know, you say, well, I named my child. Um, I don't believe God made you name your child with that name. 
but he knew it before you did. Even before the baby's born. And what does it mean that God knows our name? You know, I'm sorry if I keep saying this over and over again, but it's, we keep talking about the name of Jesus. The name. What does that mean? It's not just J-E-S-U-S. There should be a song about that. Okay. No, it's not just his name. The name represents who he is. This is him. God knew us, not just our name. He knew us before we were born. He knew all of this. He knew what was going to happen. He knew the future. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. Goes on to say this in the next verse. Verse 5 of uh, Isaiah 49. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. So what's he saying? I've been honored that the God, cho- God chose me, that, that he has selected me to be his spokesman, to be his prophet, to be his servant, to work on his behalf. God has chosen me, and I'm so honored. But when did he chose me? When did he decide this? When did he form me, maybe form me in the womb for this very reason? So it doesn't matter today if you're an introvert or extrovert. God made you that way. Because not everybody can be extroverts, right? Not everybody can be talkers all the time. Because if everybody was talking all the time, we'd be listening, right? So we need listeners and we need talkers. So thank you for being a good listener today, right? So we listen. So not everyone is made the same way, but God has made us for a reason. Do you know that we need people that can listen? But we also need people who can talk. So we need both kinds of people. But God knows he's created us for a specific reason, for a purpose. And that would be to fulfill his word in his glory. And there's a lot of other verses that talk about this same kind of thing. I mean, think about Jeremiah. We're studying Lamentations on uh, Sunday morning here at Bible class in the auditorium. Lamentations. But that was written by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was a prophet. So uh, Lamentations is a short book, uh, but it's still fairly complicated and deep and a lot of crying. Jeremiah, the longer version of the same kind of theme, same guy, um, but a lot of sorrow in his life. But in Jeremiah chapter 1, in verse 5, it says, God says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were uh, born, I set you apart. So even Jeremiah says the same thing that Isaiah did, which is the same thing that David said. And it keeps coming up over and over again about how God is working these things out even in this world. So the big question now is, what's our response? Well, I guess you know, we may say, well, if we are made in God's image, and we are, if God says life is valuable, and it is, if we are called by God to be His people, to stand up for what's right, to do what we can to encourage people to live godly life. I mean, what are we to do? I'm a little challenged sometimes in trying to figure out all the details. There are some churches that have become so much involved in what we may call the social gospel. So I don't want us to be a church that all we ever think about, all we ever do, all we ever serve, all we ever are involved in is kind of the anti-abortion. So every time we come together, we pass the petition around. Every time we pray, we pray about the unborn children. Every time there's something going on locally that we all stand outside the abortion clinics, we go for the marches, uh, you know, we're involved politically, you know, all that. I don't want to be a church known for that. I want to be a church known for Jesus. I want to be known as a church that teaches the gospel, that can change people's lives. But it would also be good for us to be a church that that stands up for the people that can't stand up for themselves. That includes that whole list at the beginning. The seniors. The poor. The foreigners. The women. People of different ethnic backgrounds. There was a time in life where, where, where somebody thought the color of your skin and the background of your religious heritage, so whether you were black or you were a Jew, that you didn't have a right to live. 
And a lot of people didn't stand up to it. They should have. I don't know if you're that familiar with Germany. At one time, they were quite a religious community. But in the 30s and 40s, things went downhill, didn't, went downhill really quickly in the religious community of Germany. So what do we do? And I'm thinking we've got to do something. So I, I guess what I'm saying is we've got to come up with a plan. Again, our plan is not going to, this is all we're going to be defined as as a church, but maybe we've got to do something. So Proverbs 24 says, Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering toward the slaughter. But if you say, we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? And I know it may be easy for us to say, well, I didn't really know what was going on. I didn't know. And I'm I'm sure there was people in Hitler's day. I mean, there are stories, documented stories of people that just lived a couple of miles away from the concentration camps and the death chambers. And after the war, they were taken to these places to see what was going on. Just a couple miles from their house. And they said, we had no idea this was happening. Well, maybe we need to be more aware. So what do we do? I don't know. But I have a really small plan. Because I have a really small uh, mind and I have really small ideas. Here's the plan. Tonight, We're going to come back, and we're going to talk about killing. Sermon topic is called Killing Minds. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from the mind, so we've got to deal with that. The mind. We're going to see what Jesus said about this idea. The mind. How we react. That's tonight. On Wednesday night, over the last year now, we have a series down in the fellowship hall. And it's called Digging Deeper, and we try to take um, Bible verses or Bible ideas or stuff about the church or something we believe, and we say, here's the topic. We, we tell the, all the students to go home and think about it for a week and find scriptures and dig it up, and, and let's come together and talk about it and figure out what the Bible says. So it's helping us all to be better learners and figure out how to work the Bible, how to work a commentary, how to work a concordance, you know, how to work all the online program so that we can actually learn how to study for ourselves. Make some good conclusions based on our own study. So this coming Wednesday night, we're going to talk about this. But not so much about more verses. Now if you want to come with more verses, we're going to spend some time talking about what the Bible says. But I want us to talk about practically what are we going to do. And I want to it's not a better answer, but I want more answers than just we got to sign a petition. Signing a petition is good. We can do that. And praying is necessary. We need to do that. But I know there's more that we can do. But the problem is, this is the problem. And this is the problem of being a Christian. This is, the pro- this is what I am challenged with as a Christian. Okay? The more we can do is something that's going to hurt us. It's going to be very inconvenient for us. It's going to be something that maybe we've never really thought of. But if we're really concerned about abortion, then maybe we need to help some young teenage girls that got pregnant unexpectedly I'm thinking they kind of knew it could have happened, but unexpectedly, and they're thinking about an abortion. I wonder what kind of difference we would make to that young woman, as opposed to us just saying, it's wrong because the Bible says it's wrong. But for us to say, listen, if you need a place to stay, come stay at my house. 
So you may be there for two years at my house. We'll help you through this. We'll support you. We'll be there when the baby's being born, if that's what you need. When the baby's an infant, we'll be there to help. Your concern, well, what about my job or my school? We'll make it so that you can go to school and maybe one of us got to quit our job so we can support you. What kind of church would, be, would we be if we made that kind of impact in the world? As opposed to just saying, well, we'll pray that things get better. Maybe we shouldn't blame them so much anyway for, for, for having an abortion. If we're not willing to get our hands dirty, to, get, to make our lives a lot more complicated than they are right now. What can we do? It's what I want. I want some ideas about what we can do, what we're willing to do. Are we willing to give a whole lot more money so we can provide places where women can go? P- giving money to the places that are already in existence for, for, for single women that are pregnant. They have nowhere to go. Maybe they've got a boyfriend they've been living with for the last couple of years, and he says, if you're not getting an abortion, I'm kicking you out. Where are they going to go? It seems very logical to me the place where she needs to go is an abortion clinic. Don't you? Well, where else is she going to go if it's not at your house? That's all I'm saying. So we've got to think about this, about what this means, and how this may change the way we view helping. And it's not just about women that are pregnant. It may be others that we can help, support, and encourage when, when they have life issue problems. But if we care, in the name of Jesus, we've got to do something. And I'm thinking, and I, whenever I do this, I, this, this lesson, it's not the first time I've done, a, not like this, this is, I know, probably too crazy today, but I've done lessons on abortion probably three or four or five times since I've been here, been here 12 years. But every time I do it, I think, well, we've got to get practical, but th- I never say let's get practical, and, and guess what, after a couple more weeks, I get back to my old way of life, my, and I'm not thinking about it anymore. Life just goes on for me. Just one more thing. Could this church, whether it's this issue or another issue, could we be a safe place? Because I don't think we've been a safe place. I mean, this would change almost everything that we've ever believed in the past. Could we be a safe place where a woman can come here and say, I don't know what to do. Thinking about having an abortion. I mean, what woman would ever come here and ask that and, and seek help? Oh, we'd be so condemning. It could be so mean. Look down upon her. First of all, maybe for the sin she's already committed to get herself in that position, but now to even think about such a thing. How can we, through grace and love and kindness and patience, could we be that? Could we be such a safe place that if a woman came and said, I'm thinking about having an abortion, she could sit down and talk with us. We talked through it, we prayed with her, and we studied the Bible, and we encouraged her, and we offered support. And then she said, I'm going to go and get an abortion anyway, and she does. Could we still love her after that? Or did she just make her own decision? You messed up again. Is there any grace left? Jesus has so much grace. He has so much love. He has so much patience. That's who we need to be. Because I know there's a lot, a lot of people here struggling with issues, with sin, with stuff going on the inside, with stuff you've thought about, and you just, you just wrestle with it, and you have a hard time overcoming it, but... We're not a safe place.
We're not a safe place to be honest, to be open, to be real. I got my Sunday best on today, inside and out. But are we willing to be vulnerable? That's, that's what I'd like us to become. Sorry, this last 35 minutes has kind of been ad lib, but I didn't plan on saying all that. But thank you for your patience. Maybe we can talk about that sometime on a Wednesday night. How can we become better people? Where people with real problems and real issues and real openness, where they can come. Luke 1 and verse 44. It's another baby. It's a baby in the womb. This is when Mary and Elizabeth, they met up together. And this is where Elizabeth said to Mary, Elizabeth had John the Baptist in her belly. She's an older lady. Old. Mary, a young woman, has Jesus in her belly. And, and, and Elizabeth said this, as soon as I... As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Even babies in the womb have life and have the Spirit of God. But isn't it great that God is the one, the Father is the one who took the initiative to say, I'm going to send my son down. And he's going to be born of a woman. He's not going to come down. He, he could have come down just as, as, as a full-grown man, as a prince, and as a king, as a mighty warrior. And he could have just come and taken over the world. But Jesus came down, vulnerable, a baby, dependent upon parents who would nurture him and feed him, help him to learn how to walk and to grow and even to be taught the things of life. He came down so that we could have life. He came down to redeem us. Paul says he came down even for the worst of sinners. Paul says that's, Paul says, that's me. Paul says I'm the worst of sinners. Because he persecuted the church of God. He killed people. He took human life in the name of religion. But Jesus came to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. If he can save Paul, and if he can save me, I guarantee you he can save you. If you need encouragement, if you need prayers, if we can help you, if you want to be baptized into Christ today, let's stand, we'll sing this song, and let us know if we can help you today.